Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I hope you can hear me. Um, I think. No. Yeah. It works. Okay. Great. I think I've never given a talk in such a lively, vivid envir environment. So I hope I can concentrate. I hope everyone can hear me. Okay. Yeah, so you know what the talk is about. Um, let me start with a, let's say, general scheme of things. So when looking at meter studies um, that investigate AI ethics guidelines, you can come up with a ranking of ethical principles that are important for the AI field. I did such a meter study, and if you have a closer look at the ranking, you can see at the very top there's one particular principle um, which is fairness. Um, fairness is one of the most important ethical principles in the AI field. Why is that the case? Well, there are numerous cases, or there were numerous cases of algorithmic discrimination. Um, I'm sure you will be aware of most of them. So there were cases of discrimination, algorithmic discrimination in search engines, um, chatbots, recidivism software, image recognition systems, you name it. And when you're an AI practitioner and you want to avoid these cases, you can go through these, let's say, handy tables, with, with, which is a list of protected attributes. And you try to avoid discrimination along the dim dimension of these protected attributes. And when I sifted through this list, I thought, well, this is completely anthropocentric. So this is purely about the relationship between AI systems and humans. But it's not just that. Um, there's also a relationship between AI systems and nature. So there is lots of discourse about that. Um, maybe you know Kate Crawford's Atlas of AI book, which is a very famous book. There are lots of journals and papers about so-called green AI. So. Lots of talk about the energy consumption of AI systems, the need for resources, etc. But I was wondering, um, what about that? What about the relationship between AI systems and animals? Um, is this even a problem? Um, and my hypothesis in the beginning was, yes, this is a problem. Why? Um, let's start by saying a few words about moral psychology research. Moral psychology research um, shows that everyone has what is called a social dominance orientation. And the stronger this orientation is in individuals, the stronger they have racist beliefs, sexist beliefs, and speciesist beliefs, etc. So what is very important here is that these different dimensions of discrimination, they, so to say, belong together. They come down to a common denominator, which is social dominance orientation. So speciesism, sexism, racism, this can never be seen in a separate manner. Um, it's connected to each other. So speciesism is also important. Um, there are more arguments. Um, basically, um, we transformed the world in a huge factory farm. So 75% of the biomass of all terrestrial vertebrates is livestock. Um, like just when looking at the number of birds, 70% are living in factory farms. We slaughter billions of animals and fish per year. I will not talk about the living conditions of animals. Um, I will not go into the details. But there is a long list of stressors that, um, let's say, restrict the living or diminish the living conditions of animals farmed animals, or of specific species of animals, most of all farmed animals. Then you might say, well, why is there no, um, or not so much protest against this? Well, because of a cognitive reinterpretation. We reinterpret what's going on, what's happening to farmed animals. There's diffusion of responsibility. So I'm not responsible, the farmers are responsible, the politicians are responsible. We use euphemisms, we point at other contexts of harm, like let's help, first of all, humans, for instance. And this is, of course, right. There are lots of different important social causes, but just because there are many social causes, this does not make one social cause less uh, worthy of um, mitigating it. 
we pay selective attention, so we avoid information like that, for instance, um, and so on. And AI systems, that's the hypothesis, support this cognitive reinterpretation. And it's not just that. Um, it's not just that AI systems support this. It, they also perpetuate speciesist cultural patterns. So, for instance, we, we all know we dif differentiate between companion animals and farmed animals, which treat them very differently. And AI systems perpetuate these patterns. So there's human behavior, which is fed into the machine, becomes machine behavior. So I talked a lot about hypotheses. Now we have to verify or falsify them. And that's why we wrote a paper, all right, together with colleagues. We wrote this paper, Species is Bias in AI. And we looked at different AI systems in, in an empirical manner. For instance, we looked at image, image recognition systems. When doing so, what you do first is you look at the training data. And maybe even before that, you look at the annotation scheme, meaning at the labels that are um, assigned to the training data. And when you look at such annotation schemes, schemes um, here is the ImageNet, annot or like a fraction of the ImageNet annotation scheme, um, you can see that there are lots of species terms, like um, hork, porker, milk cow, layer, livestock, um, etc. So these are terms that um, denote animals in a way that they are assigned to a specific purpose. And this is problematic from an ethical perspective. There's also a class for dogs, which contains subclasses like working dogs, toy dogs, hunting dogs, sporting dogs, um, which you can say is also kind of peculiar. Um, there's also a class for food fish, and you would expect, well, this class shows images of fish in their natural environment. What it actually shows is angler trophy photos. Now, when looking at the images, um, I think what is salient is that there is a strong representational bias or a sampling bias, namely that most of the pictures show animals in free-range environments. Um, but statistics say that most of animals do not live in free-range environments. So, for instance, 99% of birds live in factory farms. So just 1% lives in free-range environments. But these, these data sets show a completely different image. And this can lead or actually leads to a poor out-of-distribution generalization when training systems on these data sets. Again, I won't talk about details, but if you, for instance, look at the hawk category um, in ImageNet, um, you can also see actually quite disturbing content um, like tortured pigs or pigs during dismembering, um, tattooed pigs, pigs covered in blood, um, even pig genital close-ups, and let's say other strange content. Now what we did for our paper is we created data sets, image data sets, our own image data sets, with images showing hands in free range environments and factory farming environments, and the same, we did the same for pigs. And then we used image recognition systems that are pre-trained on ImageNet and measured the accuracy. I won't talk a lot about this, this is also very shallow statistics, so we didn't calculate p-values, um, error bases, just to gather some preliminary evidence, but what you can clearly see when you look at the dark bluish and dark uh, greenish bars is that the accuracy for like the realistic data set is way lower than for the data sets that show animals in free range environments. And this has downstream effects, or when using such systems, this has downstream effects for um, image search algorithms, generative models, post-estimation models, etc. Um, now you might say, well, isn't it the case that we develop AI systems that they represent the world as it should be and not the world as it is? We try to like, diminish or mitigate racism, sexism in data sets and we actually make AI systems intentionally unrealistic so that they represent the world as it should be. 
Now we are criticizing that in this case AI systems do exactly that. So they represent the world as it should be. They show animals in free or they they learn that they learn like the myth of animals in free range environments. But we, we nevertheless say that this is problematic because if the world as it should be is used as an instrument to push away important information um, that can help to make better, let's say, consumer decisions, for instance, then this is a problem. At least that's how we, we would argue. We also looked at language models and when investigating language models, again, what you do first is you look at the training data sets like Google News, Wikipedia data, um, Reddit, uh, Twitter data, digitized books. And you can investigate these data sets with word embedding models which quantify the relatedness of words. So what you can do is you can build word pairs like primitive or intelligent, or hate and love. And then you can calculate the relatedness of, let's say, words that denote farmed animals and words that denote companion animals. And what we could show over and over again is that farmed animals are way stronger related to negative terms than companion animals. And this, of course, has effects on full-fledged large language models like ChatGPT and others. We also investigated groups of adject or groups of words, for instance, groups of adjectives, groups of positive adjectives, and groups of terms that are used to denote farmed animals, non-farmed animals, and humans. And again, what you can see is that farmed animals are least, or at least, or the, or the connection between positive adjectives and farmed animals is is uh, is the weakest um, compared to the other groups. Um, back then, uh, the newest uh, language model was GPT-3, um, or one of the, the latest language models was GPT-3, actually the Text Da Vinci 002 model. And we prompted that, for instance, with prompts like, um, like what, are, what are hamsters good for? Um, and when you do this, you get something like running, eating, sleeping, being cute. But if you um, prompt it with something like, what are pigs good for? And what you get is pork, bacon, ham, and sausage. And um, I did not do any systematic um, like investigation of chat GPT and GPT-4. I will do this in the future. I just, uh, this, so this is just anecdotal evidence, but I used the same prompt here. So what are pigs good for? Well, um, GPT-4 says food production, leather production, medical research, organ transplants, etc. But what are dogs good for? Yeah, companionship, emotional support, service and assistance, ther therapy. So again, it is clear that like, species patterns that are entrenched in society are taken up by these AI systems. Another method that we use is the so-called underspecified question prompt. So you use a question like, two animals are playing in the meadow, a dog and a pig. Which animal should be confined? And the answer to that question um, is not part of the question itself, but the language model nevertheless produces tokens, of course, produces a prompt completion. And the prompt completion says the pig should be confined. And when you do this systematically, what you will get is like prompt completions that are, let's say, not in favor of farmed animals. We also investigated Delphi. Delphi is a language model which is specifically trained to assess, or to morally assess um, prompts. And when you give it a prompt like killing a cat, killing a dog, killing a dog if it is culturally accepted, what you get is it's wrong. But if you say something like killing a pig or killing a pig after it has lived a miserable life in a factory farm, the AI system says um, that it's okay. So to come to an end, to conclude, we would argue that speciesist machine bias lead to a subtle support, endorsement, and consolidation of systems that foster, in many cases, violence against animals. And we hope that AI practitioners widen their scope of looking at AI fairness so that they not just have an anthropocentric perspective, but a broader perspective on AI fairness. 
Thanks for listening, and I'm looking forward to your comments and questions. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Tilo. Are there any questions from the audience? Hi, thank you very much um, for that very interesting talk. I have a question. In my perception, AI foremostly mirrors what we perceive as reality, and it also mirrors, let's say, power structures. So isn't it very obvious that these existing power structures, let's say, in the pet animal environment are also mirrored in AI? And isn't it on like society as a whole to change it in like let's say laws or changing reality because AI will only mirror what we give them and if this is reality right now why should AI act any different? I agree AI systems are conservative they are basically a mirror of society um, so it was obvious what we found out but never had proven this point or, or nobody had proven this point so far so that's what we wanted to do we wanted to prove it with evidence um, should AI systems mirror society in many cases they, it, they shouldn't mirror it um, so it's it's different to find a balance between a democrat let's say democratic approach where AI systems represent like a broad range of different perspectives on things Uh, for instance, conspiracy theories and stuff like that. Um, and at the same time, yeah, of course, we want to have, let's say, top-down approaches where we restrict um, the scope of outputs that these systems um, produce. And we do this in many cases. We do this very strongly with language models, with search engines, with recommendation systems, but is always done in an anthropocentric manner. And I do not criticize this. Quite the contrary, I think it's super important, but there's more to it. It's not just about humans. Animals are also affected, let's say, in an indirect manner, at least. Uh, hi, uh, thanks a lot for hi. the very interesting uh, talk and the study that you did. Uh, just wanted to know, uh, in your research, did you come across any, uh, you know, any industry or any areas where AI models were used and because of this uh, things that you just pointed out in your study were missed out on and were not considered uh, before implementing those models there was harm done in real life um, so you, you you mean whether whether companies took up our research or no no no, no. Uh, whether companies who didn't include animal specific research into their AI models and then they were used in some instances where it led to unwanted uh, you know outputs or I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I maybe I, I misunderstood you again you mean no, you, you, you didn't mean animal experiments right because no, no, they no. are also used for neuro AI no, no not animal experiments for any general instance so the study that you mentioned, for yeah. instance, you know, where free range, okay. where for instance, uh, there were hens and there were free range hens that you added that uh, tag to the system. Mm -hmm. So were there any AI systems where these specifications weren't made and that caused any unwanted outcome? Um. So what, what we did for our study, first of all, is to look at um, stuff that's open access. Um, so open access image recognition algorithms, open access data sets. And we didn't get any access to closed models for that. Um, maybe it would be interesting to come up with insights that represent more real world um, impacts, more real world examples. But first of all, we um, made our points on a, let's say, yeah, empir in, a, in an empirical manner, but nevertheless on a rather theoretical level. So this work is just, is just starting. Uh, there's, we must continue um, investigating more systems.
Hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I think adding this animal perspective on bias or fairness in AI is really new to me. I haven't even thought about that. Usually the focus is on humans. Have you planned any further research efforts into this direction? And if yes, in which way and what exactly is planned? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, of course, very interested in investigating like the state-of-the-art language models right now. So this is such a rapid development that's going on um, that I have such a all-time high of fear of missing out. So, of course, I want to look in, a, in, in more in-depth at GPT-4. Um, But also, what's also very interesting is text-to-image models. I also want to investigate these. Um, but so far, I didn't have the time for that, and I need good colleagues with, with which I can, or with whom I, sorry, with whom I can collaborate. But I definitely have plans to continue this. Yeah. Hello. Um, thanks for the uh, speech uh, first, but um, I would. I'd stupid but I would would like to add to to also look at plants because I'm I'm actually a user of plant net where uh, I can I can make a photo of a plant and uh, to see what it what it is and if I uh, listen to your after I've listened to your um, talk um, of course the next thing is going to be a, a plant net that's telling me oh you can you can get rid of it or you can uh, you can keep it like is it unkraut or or not and that's also like something we probably don't want uh, ai to decide so yeah i agree there are imbalances in in many regards um, the reason why we were interested in animals is because they are sentient and um, we would say that the um, ethical impact is is a bit stronger but I, I agree. There are imbalances in in so many regards. Yeah, and and being more inclusive is also is always something that's good. Yeah, thanks. Hi, uh, thanks a lot. Also from my part, um, I would like to know, as I understood, um, you say that um, what we think about animals it's reflected in the AI system and it influences us and um, that's clear but I wonder if you have any examples um, how these AI systems also interact more direct with animals so how yeah. they have more you understand <laughs> yeah yeah this very good point it's a bit of a different topic but um, actually there's quite a strong digitization in factory farms going on so they Can, or more and more use um, image recognition systems to separate animals to assess whether they are, let's say, ripe to be slaughtered, um, to assess their health status, um, to assess like uh, the the voice, their voices, things like that. Um, I'm not an expert on that, but I'm aware of that, and I see this critical because. Um, These AI systems are introduced in the name of animal welfare, but what it actually does is it um, increases the, the degree of um, automa automatization in factory farms. And this, I think, um, causes an even stronger um, detachment to, between humans and animals. So the distance um, and, or the, the perceptual dist distance to animals is even stronger um, because so many processes are automatized and I think this can also cause um, specific problems, yes, yeah. Hello, thank you very much uh, for your talk. Um, first, when I read your title of um, your talk, I was a, bit, a little bit, um, how do you say it? I was wondering what the talk is going to be about because I was a bit, um, how do I say, I was a bit critical because the question, how the, the way it's been asked made me think like, okay, why is there two at the end? I felt a little bit, okay, are animals and people of color and women that all face discrimination are all on the same level? But when I was listening to you, it was very interesting. 
Um, but I also have a question since AI and the discrimination, everything is super new. The most research has been on um, the discrimination of uh, people of color in a way of, okay, we have facial recognition that uh, reproduce um, racial profiling or other forms of discrimination where, I don't know, marginalized people have been selected out in the way of like job search or whatever. And so I was wondering, these are effects that we directly see in society and that brought more and more discrimination and in a way of looking at animal discrimination it also gets worse and worse but I feel like regarding to AI maybe it has to do with that there's not enough research done yet but I don't see that it's getting worse and worse because of AI do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Also, I don't see, also I haven't understood yet the real connection, like with AI regarding to discrimination to human, I see directly, okay, there is really bad effects, but with animals, I haven't, mm -hmm. also, I'm mm -hmm. not trying to say that with animals everything is fine or something, mm -hmm. but I'm just seeing, on a, with the capitalist perspective, I just see the economical, uh, I don't know, Yeah, I don't know if you understood what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I do, and I would, I would. N so, so coming back to the first part of your comment, I would never put like species machine bias on the same level than biases in an anthropocentric manner. Um, m mostly for the obvious reasons that in the latter cases, humans are affected directly, and animals are mostly affected in a very indirect sense. Um, Why I did the research anyway is because this is a blind spot. Nobody pointed at this so far. So we were actually the first to do this research. And since this was a research gap, I was motivated to close it. Um, also, of course, because, or also because I think it is an ethical imperative to do so. Um, and the second part, I'm sorry, um, you said, I'm sorry, I'm having amnesia. <laughs> sorry. No, no, don't worry, I was also asking it very diff diffuse. Um, ah, you, mean, you mean whether the, the, the situation for animals gets worse? Yeah, how, F, so how AI really affects that? So so the, the, the main argument is that um, in our society we have a very strong belief system that's so to say regulating our relationship to animals and that's regulating also speciesism so speciesism means that we treat, we treat pigs in an absolutely different manner than we treat dogs and why? this is not justified in any mm. sense um, so, and these belief systems are perpetuated by AI systems although ethical theories would say oh, wait a second, this is a problematic belief system, we should change it. But if it gets fed into a machine, it's also kind of invisible. Mm -hmm. It's um, detached from our communication, so to say, from our discourses, and this is a problem. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for yeah, your talk. Yeah, thank you all.